Hello, my name's Alison Bailey. Welcome to this conversation with Linda Bellos OBE. Our theme for this uh, conversation is Visibility Blues, Black Lesbians Not Identifying Out of Our Oppression. I am delighted and honoured to have Linda here in conversation. Linda is a political activist for equality of some 50 plus years. She is a radical lesbian feminist, a mother and a grandmother. A retired politician who led Labour uh, Lambeth uh, Borough Council from 1986 to 1988. She was born and raised in London in the 1950s to a Polish Jewish mother and a Nigerian father. She was awarded uh, an OBE by the Queen in uh, the 2006 New Year's Honours List for mm -hmm. services to diversity. She is a proud black woman. Linda, welcome. Thank you. We are just getting to the end of, well, it was just the end of uh, Lesbian Visibility Week. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a um, Lesbian Visibility Week like no other. How visible are you feeling uh, today, Linda Bellos, <laughs> OBE? Uh, oh, can we drop the OBE? Um, were it not cold and wet, I'd be feeling being a happy dyke. Anywhere. Hey, a happy dyke. Well, yeah. I'm with you there. Now, I know that you were um, born and raised in London mm. in the 50s. Can I ask you to talk a little bit about what that was like? Yes, uh, and I'm glad you're doing so. It's important. And a lot of younger men and women, women and men, black women and men, white women and men don't know how dreadful Britain was in its post-colonial or well, almost post-colonial uh, life, especially here in London. And although I'm not in London anymore, actually, I should say in London, um, the, the racism was so overt. And I remember as a small child, and by the way, young children could go out on their own in those days. Yeah, um, I, I grew up in the 70s and, and, and we, we would go out. And, and yeah. I remember go, going home to my mother and saying to her, Mummy, what's a nigger? And my mother, as I, you've said in terms of your introduction, uh, is a white woman, but a white woman who had a very similar experience in, in terms of being called a yid. She grew up in the London of the 1920s and 30s when fascists were on the street and in the, not just merely on the street, they were on the streets in the parts of London she lived in. Um, my mother insisted that I was Linda, I was equal to anyone and that um, they were, I don't know if she used the word naughty, but she certainly indicated that she didn't have... Uh, much um, respect for them in any way. Who, who, is, who is the them that you're talking about? The fascists, the, the racists. Fascists. Yeah. The fascists or racists or both. But what was it like, what was it like as a little girl, a little brown girl in, at that time? Was there, were there we, hear, we hear stories about um, black children of that era really encountering overt racism Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a shoe polish, wasn't there, of that era? Absolutely. What um, was it called? It was called Nigger Brown. Nigger Brown. And um, I think towards the early, 20, uh, early 1960s, it stopped. They stopped, mm -hmm. they stopped television, popular culture on television, BBC, ITV. The racist jokes were there. Uh, that was a bit later for me. I had already become pretty radical by then. But... Right. Um, but, but in, my, in my life up to being seven, I was distressed and hurt by the words. It didn't really matter whether I knew the specific meaning or the history of the words. The words were said in such a way as to make it clear that I and the we, because there were other black children, smaller numbers then than there were in the next decade, but we were... Uh, 
being made to feel we did not belong. Was there any stage um, when you rejected your blackness? Or you yes, yes. When I was a very little girl, um, I, I didn't, I experienced racism, but I, uh, and the, the, the word, the word nigger was, was I, uh, uh, it was more than a joke. It felt painful. But when I, ca- when I was seven, and I don't know when exactly, but I remember standing, I can still see myself standing in the playground at Crawford Road, it probably was infant school then, and saying to myself that I was black and English and Jewish. But first of all, I was Linda. That's what I said to myself, A7. And from that point, I was able to own my own strength, own my own pride. Did you ever want to be... Did you ever want to be white? No, I think I wanted racism to go away, even I didn't know the word racism. But no, I don't think I wanted to be white. I, I, maybe I did, I don't know. The, the pre seven years old, I do have remembrances of, of scrubbing myself in the bar. So maybe I Scrubbing scrubbing yourself. In the bath to get the black away. Yeah. Um, and up until I, uh, up until I, I owned myself. Yeah. If you know what I mean. I do. I do. Because it's something that you hear from children of that generation. I grew up in the nineteen seventies, so um, things have progressed significantly mm. um, for the better um, by that stage. Although it was still quite difficult, um, very difficult at times. But it's, you're not the first black person that I've heard, the first person of dual heritage, say that as a very young child, the, the, the taunts and the abuse... It, it didn't just come from children. ...reject themselves. And it, so, but it, it, it didn't just come from children. If it had, then maybe it wouldn't have felt quite as significant. But this was coming from strangers in the street. Good Lord. Um, it kept... I re- I, now what I do remember, a very strong feeling of being with my mother uh, and my brother who was in a pram. Can't remember now. I did know the, the, the place it was, the part of London. It was probably in Kilburn. And a woman crossed the road and said, started, she, she, she accused my mother of some, some, I can't remember what the words were now. Thankfully, I've written them, but I, I haven't, I've got, haven't got them to hand, and I've chosen to hold the, that stuff lightly, but it, it was significant. My, um, she, she was entirely racist, and she said something like, you know, how could you? Our men went to war. How did it make you feel? Oh, it was my mother's reply that made me feel wonderful. My mother was robust. She didn't swear. Well, not that I would have known the word, you know, swearing, but I, one does get a sense of how people talk as to whether they're happy or sad. Or My mother had endured similar stuff herself as a child in the East End of London, where she grew up. The fascists were on the street in the 1930s. She, my mother was, she merely, not merely, She was robust in, she didn't swear, she, I think the word is rebuffed. Great. And did that, that that stuck with you? Yes. Thank you for, thank you for correcting me that the racism that you encountered, that that we encountered, wasn't just from children. Children you could forgive. Yeah, exactly. Oftentimes from adults and, um, Sometimes teachers, the teachers in our school, the teachers put all of us, all of the black children, never mind, I'm part white. As far as she was concerned, I was a nigger like the others. She didn't use that word. I can't remember how she abused us verbally, but she also put all of the black children at the back of the class. Mm. 
in fact, uh, I didn't, I didn't um, learn to write, to, sorry, no, not write, it was to read, until I was seven, because we had, a, some months before, the optician had come into the school to test us, sight reading, and it became clear that I was short-sighted. I still am, actually. Uh, once I was recommended to have glasses, and I did, I went and had my my National Health Service glasses, blasted things in pink. Anyway, um, why were blue? I chose the blue ones. I didn't get a choice. I got I, I got pink. Duh. Anyway, within I think it was three weeks, I could read. So once I had been. Saying that the teaching of the black students was so poor, they actually didn't pick up that you couldn't read the text because of your eyesight. That's right. They thought it's because we are, yeah. you know, yeah. we, 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 we are not as capable uh, as white people. That was, that was, that was the, it was that teacher, the one or two others in the school, it wasn't all of them. And I don't want to imply that all of the teachers at Crawford Road School are still there. The school is still there. SE5. They weren't all racists, but some of them were. I remember Mr. Webb, that, I do remember his name, made a little greek cypriot boy or was he turkish cypriot i can't remember his greek Cypriot. i th think he was turkish cypriot boy go up and down the stairs with a placard saying left or right and i can't remember exactly how how because he could he'd only just come to britain he knew, he didn't speak english and he was being publicly humiliated by a grown man now that you see i can cry out of that, but the, how could you do that? How to, upsetting it is for you to remember all it's, the... It's racism, it's happening, you know, all over the bloody place. What I want to do is to capture your, your story and also your pain about what you grew up with, because I think that there is a, a lack of understanding when we talk about racism as black people in Britain as black lesbians within um, the lesbian and gay and bisexual movement in the West, that people don't understand what we're talking about. When I introduced you as Linda Bellos OBE, um, you cringed- all the, Yes, all of the blasted pretty, British- You awarded it for services to diversity. On the one hand, it is a tremendous um, achievement, a recognition of your work. But on the other hand, it's linked inextricably to empire. Um, how do you feel about being awarded the OBE? Well, I opened the envelope. I thought it was a tax bill for, this, for a start. I opened the, opened the envelope and then it said that, that, uh, that I can't remember whether it said something like Her Majesty is minded to, uh, you know, and you have to say yes or no. I was angry. I was furious, actually. I, what? What, what, what I had, had I done wrong that, that I should be... Anyway, I, I phoned my partner, I phoned my brother, and I phoned my daughter, three of them, because I was going off to, I was going off to somewhere in, in, in the Midlands to teach. And uh, they all said, take it. So I did. Um, I'm not, I, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. I just the name of the thing, and 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 a little later, uh, was it Benjamin Zephaniah? Some a brother um, had rejected his, and I had chosen not to. I don't know. I'm still. I'm still. I'm still um, torn. Partly because I have similar concerns all these years later labor could have changed the title of these things if they're going to award gongs then make at least them inclusive but the british empire which doesn't even blast it exists according to their own history 
They got rid of empire. So why are they calling, giving people gongs on behalf of a, 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 an institution that doesn't exist? But it's, isn't it more than that it doesn't exist? It's an institution that enslaved and oppressed Precisely. others. Uh, and exactly. that's, that's, that's and so, the tension, isn't it? So I took it. And I, as I said, I, it, it's still ambiguous for me, you know, ambi no, I'm ambivalent is what I want to say. Can I I'm say that I'm glad that you took it because I understand all of the connotations of empire, but that part of that um, recognition that recognized your tremendous services to British society and specifically to diversity, I'm glad that it was acknowledged, but I also share your hope that at some point fairly soon, someone mm -hmm. recognized it's, it's way past time for these um, accolades to be renamed. Um, Absolutely. Not, are not forever linked to um, Britain's, um, air quotes, great colonial past. Can I, um, can I move on to talk about another one of your many achievements? And that is the, uh, you were, as I understand it, uh, the first woman of colour, the first non-white member of um, Spare Rib, the <laughs> magazine yeah. um, of the, I think, when did, when, when, when did Spare Rib stop coming out? I certainly remember seeing it in the 90s. It was around until the 90s. It, it was, was it around, uh, I don't yeah. know when it stopped. I had mm. lost touch with it, it would be fair to say. Um, it, it started in the 19, in the 1970s and I saw an advert in The Guardian, I think it was. I'm not sure. But anyway, I saw an advert um, saying that they were looking for uh, somebody who... Well, they were looking for a finance officer. Well, I had had five years in the Inland Revenue. I was pretty competent as <clears throat> dealing with accounts and et cetera. And I had graduated as a mature student from Sussex University with a politics degree and I needed a job and here was it was a part-time job what was so you were you were the, you were the only face of color there is that right yes, that's, that's right. and we've talked about the overt racism that you encountered as a as a, a child and as a young woman did you encounter racism within the feminist movement in that era under when you were at spare rib I have to say yes, but it was of a different nature. Um, what was the nature of it? Well, it was patronising. It made kind of all kinds of assumptions about black women uh, that we couldn't speak for ourselves. That, 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 so that we that, shouldn't. That we shouldn't speak for ourselves. That we couldn't. Not that we, we shouldn't. shouldn't. Yes. Ah. You see, and hence um, commissioning white women to write articles about. Caribbean, Nicaragua, wherever. But we, there was, I cannot recall having seen, I mean, because I read the back, some of the back, uh, back issues, I looked in vain for articles by black women, not just about black women. There are plenty about black women. And, and I, now, there might have been one or two that I missed, and I don't want to, you know, there might have been, uh, and I, I apologise to any woman, black woman who read, you know, who, who wrote and were published by Spare Rib at that time, but my, my overall experience, and certainly from being on the inside, listening to the conversations, listening to the discussions, I was increasingly, I think it would be fair to say, furious with the <sighs> the assumption of superiority, they were not only racist, but classist as well, even to the white working class women. <sighs> and I increasingly felt able to comment on it. Uh, I was busy, but I was increasingly becoming furious. And ex uh, of course I was excluded from the the weekly um, meeting, the meeting, the uh, what is the word for, you know, the the the, um, the editorial meeting. So I wasn't because I wasn't on the on the uh, I was mere 
an employee. I wasn't part of the kind of collective that ran Spare Rib. And I, I think, I, I don't know how, I, I, I raised the issue of me being an included member of that group rather than excluded. And um, you talked about the um, not commissioning or not commissioning um, sufficient numbers of black people. Or black accepting people. white women who would write on behalf of black women. That was you, did there come a time when you stood up to say to your colleagues at Spare Rib, look, you need to empower um, black women to speak, to find their own voices? I did, uh, I did do that. Um, I was only there for two years, let's be clear, right? You know, there were women who, who had been there before and they very much after me. Um, I, I did get the collective to agree that there needed to be more black women, not merely me. I mean, I, I knew I didn't speak for all black women. I have, um, I, I tend to have a rather, uh, you know, radical view about a range of things. And it doesn't mean that all black women, sh you know, share my view. So we did, we did eventually uh, have a number, two uh, uh, additional black women were, were, um, were recruited whilst I was there. It's fascinating I, to see that, um, because there has been struggle, I think that, that uh, women of color within feminism in the West, women of color within the lesbian and gay and bisexual movement. We've had to fight for our place, fight to be heard, um, and our white sisters and brothers um, are mostly decent, um, overwhelmingly so. Mm -hmm. It's unconscious, unthinking. Mm -hmm. And looking back, do you see that there's been a change and an improvement at all in black women's voices within both feminism and within the lesbian and gay and bisexual movement? Yes, I do see a difference, uh, a change. Some of it is for the better, some of it isn't. Um, mm. Because and the bit I find problematic now is, um, I don't know, a lack of honesty, I suppose, in which um, women feel so guilty about institutional racism that they sometimes it seems to me, wallow in it, rather than getting on and doing something about the racism in this society. Okay, so, 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 so just so that we're clear, because there'll be people who say, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> All right, because I think I know what you mean, but I'm not gonna say what I think I mean. What do you mean, first of all? Give me some examples. Well, um, I suppose really not arguing with black women, because they don't want to offend or things of that nature. And I, I, the way I felt it was, look, I'm an equal human being. If you will argue with each other, you should argue with me as well. I mean, because it's not respectful. I mean, when you're working in kind of intellectual circles, you want, I want, I want, Equality, I want yeah. politics. Yeah. When we disagree, we should all have the right to disagree with each yeah. other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it's sort of like, um, and it's not to say that classism isn't, um, mm -hmm. because, it, because it is, but you can be in a group as a black woman, uh, in a group of white women, and you can say, well, let's talk about class. And people will say, let's talk about class. You say, let's talk about race, and then suddenly oh, everyone is sort of like, frightened, terrified. Oh no, here comes the angry black woman. We yeah. don't apologize. Say we're terribly sorry. And what you don't actually get is any sort of honest discussion. Precisely. So scared and the immediate immediate reaction is one of guilt and shame and push away. And so you don't get to have that discussion, that robust debate that you would have about any other um uh, um and, and any other uh, species of inequality or difference. That's, that, that's, that's the nerve wracking thing. Or when um, you become the, is it racist? You become the, the oracle of what is racist <laughs> and what's, <laughs> no, 
know, actually. You go and have a think about it yourself. I'm not your sort of race raceometer, if yeah. you like, and, and please don't use me as that. But it's it has been a struggle. But do you know what? For all of the pain and heartache, we're getting there. And I think we are in our own way, doing doing all right. And we, of course we could do better. Um, but but we are we are we are doing okay. Can I move on? Um, bearing in mind that it is the, t the theme, um, lesbian visibility or invisibility, and the extent to which black women um, refuse to try and self-identify, black lesbians refuse to self-identify out of our oppression. You have a very um, powerful uh, and difficult coming out story, harrowing in fact, ultimately triumphant. Could you talk about that a little bit, please? I assume you're referring to the loss of my children. Wherever you want to start it, Linda, it's well, entirely up to you. Um, you came out at 29, is that right? Yeah, tw 20, I, was I 29 or 28? Late uh, It was 1979, so I would have been just coming up to 29. So and were you married? Yes, married. I've been, I got married in 1970. I had, I, we had two children. And uh, when I, I when I when I realised I was a lesbian, I wanted John to leave. It was John your husband? Yeah, I wanted him father my children. I wanted him to leave our house. I was paying, you know, I had been paying for paying the mortgage and whatever in his years of not as a student or we don't know. He didn't have a mortgage when when he was a student, but certainly I he had been, he'd been financially dependent mainly on me. Um, and that was the deal, you know, I knew that. But when I came out and when it became evident to me that he wanted a mother, he wanted me to mother him, to care for him, to do all the, the things. And I wasn't willing to do that, certainly not with sex involved. Um, so um, I asked him to leave and uh, I think he said yes at first. And then he, I don't know who he consulted, but he came back and said no. And I just thought, I'm not having major arguments in front of my children. For us to be arguing all the time, which would have been the case had I stayed and he stayed. So I moved out. We agreed that I would come and take, put the children to bed every night. That that's, that was the deal that I would, because they were at school, and et cetera, so that I would, they would see me. Um, even though I had moved out. I could have moved to a women's house. The difficulty was they didn't take boys and there was no way I was going to take my daughter and not take my son. And I still find it painful to remember. These were young women who had no idea Anyway, anyway, it's not their fault. It's that's how it was in those days. So, um, so I, he stopped me looking, he stopped me visiting them. And there was a period in which I did not see my children. These were little, they were little, seven and five, which Linda, is not. Can I, can I, can I, can I ask you something? And it's something that our younger viewers may not realize. But up until I think, if I'm correct, the early 1990s, lesbian mothers were routinely um, prevented from having custody in the ordinary course of events as mothers of their children, simply by the virtue of the fact that they were lesbians. Yes. Being a lesbian, as far as the British justice system um, uh, regarded it, made you unfit to be okay. a mother and children were taken away from women. And that can be very, very hard. More than hard. Think about it, impossibly hard. But I um, think for the records, so people understand what women like you have been through, that it's worth remembering. And, and that was your experience, wasn't it? It was. Um, when I finally got access to my children, the social worker, I was living in London and my children were still in Brighton. 
social worker brought them up and stayed with me while I spent time with my children because as a lesbian, I was assumed to be unsuitable, unfit. I think the word was unfit. It was. It's, it's, um, unfit is the word yes. you see in the yes. um, newspapers, well, in the judgments. That was that was not just said to me, it's not, it's not just the blasted word, that's how the state acted. I wasn't alone, I was in a lesbian mother group um, until, I can't remember how, for how long, until we got some, we got some rights. I didn't do a huge amount of work in that group, I don't want to claim that, or well, lots of women who were, women who would qualified as solicitors, which was a new thing again. Lots of things were happening in the, the women's liberation movement, women yeah. as lawyers, um, yeah. uh, and, and... And this is where you see things make it, this is where you see things make a difference. This is where it matters to have women in those positions. It matters to have lesbians in those positions because gradually cultural norms change. Yes, we it's thought abhorrent. for them. It's abhorrent abhorrent to think that mothers were deprived of their children, treated <laughs> like predators simply because they were lesbian. And yeah. that fathers, fathers deployed that knowing that any ragtag man, in, I'm not talking about your husband, but someone who had not um, been able to financially support his uh, family, who relied on his wife to go out of work, could say, she's a lesbian and get the kids. And that was the end of it. And I'm so sorry that I've upset you. Are you okay? Can we um, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I mean, the, good, <laughs> the great wonderful thing now is, of course, that my children, my grandchildren, <laughs> uh, I could, I mean, thankfully, um, Hannah is not, my eldest grandchild, uh, is not planning on having a child soon, but she will, I hope, uh, make me a great grandmother <laughs> in due course. I think 10 years would do fine. Um, <laughs> Um, she's yeah she's she's in her mid she's in her uh, yeah she's 25. Um, is that your grand your granddaughter's in her mid my, my oldest granddaughter is fantastic 25. yeah and so through all of that through all that you went through you came out of it with a relationship with your children yeah your children yes. yes that's amazing and I knew I would because I remained my children's mother Nothing he could say or do would alter the fact they came out of my body and I loved them. And at different times, my grown children or my children have come to live with me, um, you know, and stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't want to dwell upon them, let them say for themselves what they want to say yes. with me or without me. Uh, but yeah, um, and I was involved in um, the Lesbian Mothers Group. Yeah. We did campaign, fight for the rights of lesbians to be mothers. And you succeeded. And I think that it's, it's that struggle that I want to continue on to talk about, just changing topics slightly, because the word lesbian is a word that increasing numbers of young women, young same-sex attracted, are really struggling with. And I think that it would be really useful to have a think about that. I can remember when I was a younger woman and I was living in Northern California, that there were a number of black women, black women who were in relationships with other women um, who were fundamentally um, same-sex attracted who said, I can't call myself a lesbian. That's for white women. That's a white word. I, I have no relationship to it. Um, and I have to say that I've struggled with the word lesbian. I'm waiting for another word to come out. <laughs> on the one hand, on the other hand, I recognize that, probably like you, that any word used to describe women who are exclusively, uh, uh, intimately, sexually, romantically attracted to other women, that word, is always something that we're going to have to constantly um, claim back from those that would wish 
to label us um, as something less than or as something offensive. And that word is lesbian. Maybe mm. is, a, is, a, is, is, is a runner up. So it's an act of empowerment and it's an act of defiance um, that I use it. And I also, with time, I use it with pride as a black lesbian. Yeah. Now, um, there are other people that, I don't judge other people who want to call themselves gay or whatever else, but for me, as a black lesbian, it feels important to say that. What's yes. your relationship to the word lesbian then? Well, I take exactly the same view as you. It's a, uh, it's, I am proud to be a lesbian. And I, I feel a solidarity with white lesbians and black lesbians and disabled lesbians. And let's go through the, we are, for me, it's not, the word has a history and it's a history of struggle and it's a history of, we have overcome our marginalization the silence that have been imposed upon, the, 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 the loss of our children, the being put, loss of our jobs, being put in prison, a whole host of things. And I feel proud to be in that group of heroines. That's what we are. Every time we use that word, it's noticeable how many men, people in the LGBT community don't like lesbians. No, they don't like lesbians that haven't got penises. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry <laughs> to be facetious because, because it's very easy. It's very easy in the West to forget that there are women who are same-sex attracted, who are lesbians, who will be murdered. Mm-hmm. They will be, they will suffer the most extraordinary abuse at the hands of men and at the hands of women, um, but predominantly the hands of men and, and at the hands of males within a male patriarchal society. And so we claim lesbian proudly for ourselves, but not all women do, and particularly not, not all younger women. And there seems to be, doesn't there, this um, fashion for um, having outward appearance whether it's of masculinity or femininity, define everything about ourselves. I mean, it's, it's like we've gone back to the 1950s. Absolutely. Um, but I, and certainly when I, when I was coming out and, 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 and uh, you know, as a, as a young lesbian in the, 19, um, the late 1980s and early 1990s, um, people played with their gender identity, I think it would be, would be termed, and you had, you had your quote unquote butch um, lesbians who dressed in, you know, in, in um, men's clothing or in masculine clothing or didn't tell you anything very much significant necessarily about how they viewed themselves. Now, it's everything. Now, if you, if you um, are, are, are a, a woman, a female who is same sex attracted, there is immense pressure, I fear, for you to identify as masculine, as male, and now as literally a male. What, what do you make of this? Well, uh, it makes me furious because it is such a denial of our history. Some of these young women should know about the gateways. The gateways which were, and I, frankly, I only went there twice. I hated the blasted place. However... That's it, what it is, that's what it is. Well, it was a women's club, a lesbian right. club. All right. In in uh, in Chelsea. In Chelsea. Uh, in Chelsea. All right. Um, and it was so full of butch femme. The old. I mean, that's what makes me kind of laugh about these young people who know nothing about their history. They are. They 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 have some notion that somehow, if they put on a suit, they're sort of being kind of radical, as though it wasn't done before. Oh, it's so foolish. Uh, you know, I, I, sorry. You, so, sorry. Can I can can I be clear? I, I like you. I suspect if if a female um, wants genuinely to live an authentic life, living as a male, 
good luck to you is what I say. Yeah. Concerned about, and I, with good reason, from having spoken to detransitioned um, lesbians who have gone through amputations of breasts and hysterectomies and phalloplasties in, in some circumstances, who recognise that they were in turmoil about being same-sex attracted, that they do not know that the history of lesbians, mm. that we have assumed female, feminine, masculine, gender identities on a, uh, um, and have played with those. And so the idea that because someone is wearing a suit that they are assuming the role of being a man or that because someone is wearing a, a dress, a lesbian is wearing a dress, that she is being quintessentially um, feminine in some sort of 1950s ideal was patently nonsense. Um, it's, a it's a reversal of the reality. The reality of... I don't know. The, 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 we, we call them straight, well, we should, perhaps shouldn't, but we call them straight dykes, as in they... Straight dykes. Straight, we call them straight dykes because they weren't feminist. They, they, they played out the male, the, 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 you know, the butch femme roles. Uh, not merely, I don't know what they did in bed, but I'm, I'm talking about in, in their social, in their social uh, relationships. And uh, they weren't very fit. And, and, and many of them used the, the, the Gateways Club. That was, yeah. and, and, and uh, uh, equivalents around the country. There's that saying, isn't there? What is it? Um, butch on the streets. <laughs> I mean, it's quite crude. It's quite crude. But what it However, did, in, what, what it does illustrate, however, is that you can't look at some woman in a nightclub wearing a suit and have any, in, any reliable um, uh, impression as to whether this person was going to carry out a masculine role in all things and for all purposes. Um, sometimes it was quite, quite the opposite. But now, in, in all seriousness, we have this exponential, this huge increase in the number of young women who are wishing to live and wanting to live lives as, as males to the point that they are um, going through medical transition, mm. um, breasts are being amputated, beards are being grown, hysterectomies are being um, performed, and increasingly um, phalloplasties, um, phalluses are being fashioned from other parts, other body tissue. Rona Hodgkins, who I'm very proud to work with at LGB Alliance, made this observation, and it's something that many of us have made. If this is actually a genuine phenomenon, why aren't the likes of you and I, Linda, licking down the doors of the gender clinics asking for our breasts to be removed and to grow beards? Where, no, really, where, where are? Yeah. Where are the middle-aged lesbians who wish to live as men in these numbers? Where are they? Do you know them? Have you encountered them? No, not, not one. It, it's so shocking. It's not funny that young women don't know any of their history. I went to um, a screening of, um, of the film about Gluck, the lesbian. Um, and afterwards, at the sort of, after the screening, um, where was it? It was in Hackney and it was a nice place and blah, blah. And at the social afterwards, a small group of young dykes, is how I describe them, wearing suits. Now, I was wearing a suit as well. I often wear a suit. Um, and they came up to me and invite, were trying to invite me to come and join them in their club. And it became evident to me that they knew nothing about the history of which they had actually were members. They knew nothing as though, as though the lives of, of the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s of wearing suits. I don't know. I mean, certainly in, in the feminist days, women tended not to... Uh, lots of women would, wear, would be wearing dungarees deliberately as, a, as, a, as a, a fashion statement that they weren't going to put in on dresses or suits. I was a dress, I was a, uh, I was a, a, a suit wearer. They assumed I would be uh, 
I would be sympathetic about, or indeed I would be one of their group. And I made it very clear that, that the politics that they were reflecting was so out of date, so unrelated to the history of lesbians, that it was actually offensive. Was that, was that because, Linda, they, they were seeking to read down from what they were wearing into deeper roles about feminine and masculine? Oh, I think they definitely were. I, I mean, this is a serious question, and I can ask it to you as a black woman. If we can have, if you can, if you can change your gender, can you change your race? And if not, why not? Well, do you know what, um, Linda? Th th it's a very good question. In fact, as you were talking, um, I was thinking about uh, when you were, you know, under seven and you were trying to scrub off the black. Um, if there were a pill that one could take, that little black girls and little black children were given to make themselves white because they didn't want to be oppressed anymore, would we be celebrating that? If hordes of us, if hordes of us said, right, we're, tonight, we're going to, tomorrow morning, we're going to identify as white. Mm. How far are we going to get, do you think? Mm. But I, I think the time is upon us where a white male will stand in front of me and he will tell me that he is a black woman. Yeah, and that, no, wait, hang on, I'm not finished yet. Not only is he a black woman, but he's more oppressed than me. <laughs> by, <laughs> by, by virtue of the fact that he is doing this extraordinary thing, which is identifying as both black and female. Theirs is the kind of radical approach mm. without any notion of where it comes from and what, who it serves. It certainly is destructive to women seeking to destroy masculinity and sexism. I want to discord masculinity as the made notion of what a man should be. Yeah. There are many men who want to destroy and I wish they'd get on and do it. Yeah. Um, but I am, I am saddened by the young black women who have been swallowed up by a critique of gender, the gender critique. I don't think there are any more than I think there are races. There's racism, but there's ra but not, not races. Yeah. In the same way, there are not, there are sexes, but there are, I'm not sure that there are genders. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm very clear that, that gender identity is only relevant for those who are gender dysphoric that is a, as a model for understanding um, sexes, sexism and oppression, it is um, uh, worse than useless. My mm. is that schools and schools of young women are seeking to identify out of their oppression. And um, it's, it's sad. It's sad that, that, that feminism and women's rights and women's liberation have reached a point where so many young women are looking out onto a future um, living as women and are saying, no, thank you. I don't mm. And what I suspect that many of them are experiencing from what I've read, what I hear people say, um, is freedom. And Indeed. I want women to demand freedom, to demand an end to male violence and male oppression as women. I don't want them to have to identify out of womanhood. And I think that politically, we have to be able to say that because at the moment, even to go near it as a discussion can be labeled as transphobic. And it's like what you said, if scores of us black uh, children woke up and said, right, mummy and daddy, I want to be white. Let me go and get that pill to be white. Let me go and bleach my skin to be white. And scores of us were allowed to do that. Would, would society say to black people that we couldn't inquire uh, uh, of the experts as to what was going on, whether this was a manifestation of internalized self-hatred, it was a manifestation of oppression? And so let's move on. Um, uh, 
to talk about marriage equality because you in your lifetime have gone from seeing lesbians deprived of their children, deemed unfit, to same-sex marriage. Good or bad thing in your view? Well, I'm not a fan of marriage. Um, I have been and was uh, a, what's the word, we were, um, forgive me, I'm having, uh, we had a civil partnership. partnership. Yeah, and I was in favour of that. Um, I, my partner died um, three years ago. I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, And Marion and I uh, were planning next month to (laughs) enter a civil partnership if the the health situation. (laughs) Um, Anyway, I marriage is an institution whose whose history is long and in general not helpful to women. That's a very polite way of putting so, it. So, so do, you, do, you, do, you, do you regard, because I, I think that um, there is a plurality of, of views about marriage within the gay community that I think many heterosexuals probably um, don't understand. Because on the one hand, I think that I want people to have equal rights of citizenship mm-hmm. and you can get married then so be it. But on the other hand, I, I, I regret that as a movement, we were encouraged to regard marriage equality as the pinnacle of our liberation. Ah. When it was never going to be any such thing. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with you. I think some people thought that it was, because they had no politics, that, that their notion of equality is let us do what the other man has done. It, it, we, what is a good thing that has happened only recently, but not opposite sex couples may enter civil partnerships. This is a good thing. They want what we have. It's a why good is thing. It, why, why is it a good thing, do you think? What, civil partnership? Yeah, for, the for, opposite, he- for heterosexuals. Well, because they have a critique of marriage, which is not a million miles from yours or mine. So uh, by that, are you saying that the, the heterosexual civil partnership gives women a way to, to have the equality of a uh, of a formalized union without having all of the um, patriarchal associations that's right of of marriage I yes see. yes lgb alliance formed um in october on the 22nd, 22nd of october 2019 that's just over six months ago and it sent shockwaves around the world how dare lesbian gays and bisexuals form an organization without the team. <laughs> uh, how dare you? How dare you? It's not allowed. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, this is extraordinary. It's not allowed. But, but here's the thing. That it's not allowed, you can't do it, wasn't just echoed by a few ragtag um, people. It was repeated at the highest levels oh, you're right. of government. You're Labour suffered a historic defeat in the Christmas general election. And then they went into a leadership contest where the three leaders, Sir Keir Starmer, Lisa Nandy and Rebecca Long-Bailey, they didn't trip over themselves to pledge to fight the rank misogyny and homophobia that is running rampant in the country. They didn't pledge to stop rapists being able to identify as women and go into women's prisons. prisons. They instead, to my mind, thoroughly disgraced themselves by in various forms, pledging to pursue gender self ID. I mean, two of them, the two women, yes. signed pledges to expel, expel women. I'm so members, to- Let me finish, Spell, expel women who were members of LGB Alliance and a women's place. And I want to ask you, is there any hope for Labour? Of course there is. They can be changed to happen. It's the rebuilding of a women's liberation movement. That in, in itself is not enough to win an election. What we have to be is a voice 
a voice that influences the political okay. process. So what you're saying, if I've understood it correctly, is that there is scope for a credible opposition to find its relevance again. Yes. And I think you're right, but I don't think it can happen. It may not be the Labour Party then. I think you're right. I think that, I think that the, my sense is that Sakia, uh, Lisa Nandy and Rebecca Long-Bailey, when they were saying these things about trans rights and trans rights being human rights and not standing up for women, I think they thought that it was going to be politics as usual, that at some point they'll say, oh, well, we got it wrong, but let's move on. I don't think they understand the degree of pain and rage that I certainly feel um, about what they have done. Um, and I do think that um, we're living in uncertain political times. Hold on to it. We have to demand that females, women, are not lost as a political class. That right. when, um, uh, our rights are not dictated to by any male that comes along. Yeah. The parallels with self-ID on that side of the Atlantic and this side of the Atlantic are clearly there. We're having a debate in, in, in the UK. It really hasn't been happening in the mainstream, mm. has it? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't, it doesn't look as though there's a debate in the country. I know that I, yes, I went to Washington um, last year and uh, when did I go? And, I, and I, got, I went to New York in, I think, October o on the same issue. And that was really interesting. Some of the same women I met in, in, in Washington, I met in, 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 um, in New, New York. What was very noticeable to me was a, a, a cohort of young black women who were present, which was, I must say, of um, tremendous uh, delight on my part. They, their concerns were similar to our concerns about what this does to women, to girls, yeah. how, how, how it takes us back before we had the vote. Hopefully we and other women will be discussing, and I hope men do as well. Men, I, I, I have views about what I think men should do, which is to have a, uh, a, a, a movement which re, what's the word? Reviews, that'll do. Masculinity. Yeah. It's so men can wear dresses and lipstick and nail polish. Oh, yes, yes, oh, and I want to leave you, I want to ask you with my final question. What would you say to the young women who are same-sex attracted, whether they want to call themselves gay or lesbian, whatever, same-sex attracted females who are thinking that they have to become males to live free and authentic lives. What would you say to them, Linda? Don't do it, girl. That's what I would say. Linda, um, it's been an absolute pleasure and a delight and a privilege to talk to you. Um, thank you for all of your years of activism and service. You are someone who is respected by lesbians, uh, gay men um, alike, and by bisexuals, and by women. And um, thank you very, very much for your service. Thank you. It's going a bit far, though. I mean, we... <clears throat> anyway, uh, thank you sometimes, for... Sometimes, Linda, you just have to accept a compliment with grace. All right. Yeah, okay. uh, sometimes okay. you just have it's to just, do that. And, you know, there's a funny thing about black women. You talk about racism. But if I had said this to a white woman, she'd have just said, fine. Yeah. You've, cringed, you've laughed. You've been self-deprecating. Why is that? Why uh, because I'm fearful. I, I, I read politics as my degree. I, my, I went to university wanting to learn and understand how can one have power and influence without being being uh, demolished by power in the sense of the, the egoism, the, 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 all of the things that can be wrong with politics.
for the individual. I mean, dictatorship, all kinds of rubbish. So I'm, I, I, can I, can I, can I, yes, go on. Can I say something? When I was a, a young woman, when I wasn't even a woman, I was a girl, the 1980s, you were the only black lesbian in public on TV. You were the only one. There was no one else there. I, I know that. And I, and I know so, what I was because I felt alone. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, I, and so when I say thank you, I mean it. Thank I you. Mean thank I, you. I, and, I, and, I hear you. I and, hear and, you. And, and, and accept that, please. Because I, I do. I do. But that's not what I was. My, my reaction, my, my reticence is about the future and wanting power. What I want to do is to have some influence, to be in, in debates and discussions that are democratic. What I fear, and what I went to university to, to study how one could have some influence without it becoming uh, corrupted by one's ego. And that is, it, it is a real, uh, it's a real problem for all politicians. The ones who want it, the fascists want it for themselves. I, I'm a socialist who wants to see fairness and humanity. Fairness is too weak a word. I want to see every human being, all of us as human beings, have, in my judgment, equal rights. And I will argue against the, with, with those I don't agree with. That's part of my right. It's part of theirs to defend themselves, etc. So, so I, 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 am, I am critical of the abuse of power. The one, one needs some power in order to achieve the things one wants. But be, 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 but one has to also be humble and because it leads to pedagogy. You know, I don't want to be, I, that, I'm reticent about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Thank you, Linda. Thank you.